today. Thank you, team. Um, You know, our heart here at Grace Church is to really reflect the richness, the diversity of God's family around the world, grateful for the continuing growth and diversity here at Grace. And I think that just honors the heart of God. That's what heaven's going to be like. And so you might not be aware that we have here at Grace every week an Arabic fellowship that actually meets right now. Every week at noon, they have worship in Arabic, Bible teaching, et cetera. There's a Vietnamese fellowship every week. There's a deaf church that meets here every Sunday. And we have a new one, a Spanish fellowship that's gonna be launching here at Grace. And so we're really excited about that. And uh, tell tell us about it, Emmanuel, yeah. 
So um, <clears throat> the Spanish Fellowship is actually something that's been on the hearts and minds of leadership, as well as a large uh, population of the Spanish community here at Grace Church. So um, essentially, the name of the Spanish Fellowship is called Aviva, which means to revive or to give life or, or to refuel. So the vision is that we would, it would be an outreach ministry to the Spanish community in Cleveland. And we would bring them to a healthy church and um, you know, make them aware and offer them services that Grace offers, um, resources, things like uh, you know, lively fellowship, lively worship, and Bible study, and things like that. You know, one of the things we've found is that when someone has, like a family member speaks another language as their heart language, Grace can be a place where like the children maybe prefer English, grandma for, prefers you know, Spanish or Arabic, so I, I just... I love what you're doing, Emmanuel and uh, Lumar. Um, when will the Spanish Fellowship meet, and who's welcome to attend? I like your t You already got a T-shirt going on there, yes. too. I like that, Aviva. <laughs> All right. Uh, we, our first service will be the 15th of April. We'll meet at 2 p.m. in the middle school room. Uh, and anyone who speaks Spanish or loves the culture is, is welcome to come. And we also have a Bible study that meets currently at 12 o'clock in room 36. We're hoping to uh, launch new small groups out of that ministry as well. Great. And you might, speaking of that, uh, Lumar is our director of small groups here at Grace. And we're just seeing so many neat things happening in that area. We have uh, well over 50 groups that are meeting, and that's going to keep on growing. But uh, need to hear that be happening out of that fellowship as well. So we hear that um, the Hispanic population is growing in America. Tell us some statistics about Cleveland and the nation as a whole. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> Hispanics, uh, the Hispanic community is actually one of the largest um, minority groups in the nation, um, currently standing at about 18% in the nation. And CNN is projecting that number to go up to 28% by 2060. Um, in Cleveland alone, uh, we're looking at about maybe 34% of Cleveland is actually um, non-white Hispanics. And um, given the fact that Puerto Rico is um, a U.S. territory, given the recent you know, tragedies that happened with Hurricane Maria, um, about 20% of those who live in Puerto Rico are actually coming over to the states, places like Florida and Ohio. So, um, and I know a lot of Hispanics in inner city Cleveland are starting to move over to places like Brooklyn and Parma and Middleburg Heights and places like yeah. that. Why would anybody move to Florida? You want to come to Cleveland, Ohio. Like, this is the place, right? This is the place to be. Um, that's neat. Um, so if people want to know more and just get information, talk about it, ask a question, how can they do that? We'd love to meet you today out in the lobby. Several of our team members are there. Um, so yeah, step on by our table. Excellent. You guys, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. This is exciting to hear about. Yeah, it's great. So glad to have you here. Some of you have been here for a long time. Really glad just for how you're making a difference, you're growing. Some of you are newer to Grace, and we're delighted to have you here. And there's a couple of things I'll just want to let you know about that can help you sort of find your way. First, there's this card in the bulletin. looks like this, and it's just a way for you to be in touch. I'd like to send you a note, send you some uh, certificates for free stuff in the cafe. And you can check any appropriate boxes. Also, after this service, uh, 10 minutes after it finishes today, we have what's called Taste of Grace. It's a light lunch, one level up, and what we call our atrium chapel. You can go up the stairs one level or up the elevator. And no RSVP needed, so if you are thinking, I don't know what I was doing for lunch anyhow, and maybe I'll just hear what's going on at Grace. Uh, you can, uh, in 60 minutes, you'll meet some of the staff. Mary and I will be there. And uh, you can ask whatever questions you might have. There'll be about 50 people there, so you won't be alone. And so that's just an opportunity for you to find out more about, about Grace and get a free lunch while you're at it. Uh, kids are welcome. And if, you, if the person who invited you to Grace is here, they're welcome to join you uh, as well. Um, also, coming up in just less than two weeks is Good Friday. And then two weeks from today is, is Easter. Um, and so a couple of things about that. On Good Friday, we'll have a service at 7 p.m. Pastor Austin Shaw will be speaking at that. Our high schoolers will be involved in a cool artistic way. We have uh, communion that's happening. And so uh, love to have you join us as we remember what Jesus did for us, the suffering he endured on our behalf. And then Easter, Saturday, and Sunday, we have five services. I'll be speaking at all of those. And we have 5 and 7 on Saturday, 5 and 7 p.m., and then Sunday at 9, 11, and 1. So you're going to have a little bit extra time on that day uh, if you want to come at the 1 o'clock. Or maybe you want to come at uh, Saturday evening. That will be a little bit, little more room, but we're 
moving the services apart just to help with flow of traffic and, and all the rest. Um, I'm really excited about this service. I've been doing some message prep. Our, our worship team has some creative ideas in mind. And Easter is not meant just for us. This is news that we want to share with others. So you've got a card in your bulletin. You can hand that out to somebody, uh, a neighbor, a colleague, whoever, and say, hey, if you don't have a place to go for Easter, we would love to have you join us here at Grace. I'll save a seat for us and uh, meet him and grab some coffee afterwards. So there's a card. Also, you'll see on the screen a couple of signs that our team put together, an Easter sign or I love my church, or you can put both. Uh, you know what's been sort of neat is that people here at Grace, not only is that sort of a, oh, I've thought about that or heard about that church, and I, but people have found out that that person five doors down or around the block, they go to your, they go to the same church, and they're like, I know you went to Grace, and and so it's been a, a way for people to connect here as well. So you can pick one of those up uh, by the front doors on your way out if you'd like uh, for these next uh, couple of weeks. So that's Easter weekend, just two weeks away. Looking forward to that and what God's going to do. And then there's an announcement I'd like to make uh, that uh, we're excited about. The elders have been uh, discussing some um, capital projects, and we have a building committee that's been hard at work. And uh, and. I wanna just tell you, first of all, the rationale for why we're doing these couple of projects. Our heart is to just welcome people from all kinds of backgrounds, all ages, ethnicities, religious backgrounds, to say we want Grace to be a place where people feel welcome, and especially the next generation. Uh, you may have read how 20-somethings are leaving the church in droves, um, teenagers, I think we can all have a picture of someone in our mind that we say, you know, I do, I do know a teenager that sort of walked away from God or has no interest and or a 20-something. What if we could make grace a place where they felt a warmer welcome? And we just said, you know, this is a place for you to grow and, to, and you know, especially as our church senior pastor, not to name any names, gets a little bit older. Um, I came here 20 years ago, like this week, um, that at the age of 33, and now I'm 42. Uh, it's amazing <laughs> the way the math works uh, here in Cleveland. And so, uh, but we want to make sure that we're saying to the younger generation, hey, there's a place for you. You're welcome here. We, we love having you. So two projects on that basis. The first one is uh, a, a dedicated kids' chapel. Right now, the kids' chapel that they met in this morning looks like this right here. Um, and, be, and it's, it doesn't really shout like kid-friendly, right? Because we do weddings there and funerals and we do alpha dinners and all kinds of things. And now we have an atrium chapel. We said, what if we made that space there look more like this? With a lot of color and with like a Noah's Ark kind of little slide they're planning on putting together and, and just where kids walk in and they go, this is our room and, and this is a place for us. We have a great volunteer team for our Grace kids, and we want to give them a great space as well. So that's project number one, a place that will be a warmer welcome uh, for children uh, here at Grace. The second project relates to our lobby, uh, our lobby for everyone coming in. After almost 15 years of use, this part of the building, um, and we figure about 5 million sets of feet coming into this. You might not be aware that not only do we have Sunday four services, but we have hundreds and hundreds, often over a thousand people coming in here through the week for uh, Bible studies and small groups and recovery groups and exercise classes and a, a Shroud of Turin presentation on Friday night, all, weddings and funerals and all kinds of things that happen here during the week that, uh, that people just say, I, I found a place, divorce care, there's grief share or something like that. And so with that usage, which we love, comes some wear and tear like you see on the on this next one here and, and the carpet, we could have taken a lot of pictures that look like that. And that happens also, if you were to go through a lobby, we have seating, I think I counted for 10 people. Not very generous, there's some seating that looks like this. And, uh, and if you don't get there quickly, it's gonna be taken up. And so we've said, what if we could have seating for like 100? And so what we're planning on, if, you'll, uh, is, if you guys want to go to the next slide here, is something that uh, the scope of the project will be the whole lobby, but we like to have a, a feature there that would just say, we want to be better at hospitality and to have something like 
this right here, to have a cafe. And you go, where is that gonna be? Oh, we have some people cheering that on, all right. And, um, and where that would be is our workroom over here where we do all of our copying and we've got all kinds of shelves behind the wall and there's some cubicles. We would move those to the lower level and we would open up that space and the lobby would have seating for like 100 people. And so, and we would have, you know, better coffee. Um, some of you my age, you just be honest here, some of you my age, you're like, these young people are like coffee elitists, right? But the younger people are going, you guys probably could like make some improvements in the coffee here. So there'll still be free coffee, but we'll also have uh, uh, like other kinds of coffee, like lattes and stuff like that. And so, but it'll be a place really not for, it's a place to say hospitality. My daughter, two of our daughters were home for spring break this week, so we went downtown and took them to this nice coffee shop. And when we walked in, I was like, wow, this is like a communal space. Like people love coming here. They're on their computers, they're talking over coffee. And it wasn't, the coffee was just a reason to sort of bring them in, but it was just an inviting space. That's what we want there to say, we want a, a space alone will not bring people to Jesus, but it will say, hey, you're welcome here, and there's a place for you. So <clears throat> an artist's rendering of what the actual drawing will look like sort of gives you a little bit of a space there, and, uh, and that'll happen. The next picture shows where that will be sort of from up above, and you'll see how that uh, would happen there. And then the next few pictures, again, some artist's rendering of the lobby, uh, then the welcome center, the whole idea is to have a warmer welcome. There's an insert in your bulletin today that talks about that, some of the questions you may have, and there will be an informational meeting a couple weeks after Easter that talks through that, and so you'll uh, have more details. Cost of the project is sort of coming in right now, and they're sort of trying to get that one uh, defined, and the elders have been discussing this, and so appreciate your prayers for continued wisdom for our leadership team, and I think by the end of summer, you'll say, wow, both our children's area and our lobby have become a much more welcoming place, and, uh, and that's our heart, is to exalt Jesus by making disciples who just love him with all their heart, growing with others, and uh, figuring out their gifts and serving a world that's in need. And so uh, uh, I'm excited about what's to come, and uh, you'll be seeing some construction stuff go on here, Lord willing, in these uh, coming couple of months. So that's a couple of happenings at Grace, sort of a family chat, that if I waited for annual meeting, uh, a lot of you would miss out. So I wanted to do something here on a Sunday about that. So let's pray. We're gonna do things a little bit differently today. I'm gonna give the message first, and then we're gonna have respond and worship. And, and so let's pray, and then we'll dig into God's word, okay? Father in heaven, uh, when I mentioned a few moments ago, I said I think we all can bring to mind a face, a name of someone we love, a teenager, a 20-something that is not in the kind of relationship with you that we would love for them to be. And Lord, I thank you that you know every one of those individuals by name. And even this week, Lord, we would pray in the powerful name of Jesus that you would bring winsome believers across their path that you would give them a hunger for you and for things of eternity. That God, they would become dissatisfied with what this world offers outside of a relationship with you and would realize even all of these good gifts that we can have in life become meaningless if we are not connected in relationship with you. God, I pray that whether they're, they experience uh, just really good fortune, that they would say, there's a God who's being very gracious to me. Or if they go through a crisis, they would say, I, I need someone bigger than I am. So Lord, we pray for each one of these and thank you that you love them even more than we do. Father, I thank you that you love the people in our greater Cleveland area. And I thank you for an Arabic fellowship. Thank you for the many from India who, who gather for fellowship, for those who are deaf and the Vietnamese who meet this afternoon. And, and Lord, for a Spanish fellowship that's launching, Lord, we pray for open hearts, for wisdom, and God, that our church would be a place that we would say, um, we're seeing more and more reflect uh, ultimately what heaven will be like. People from every language group, every people and, and nation. 
And so God, uh, we, we ask, give us your heart, we pray. We see it on the, the decor on the platform here that is here, there, and everywhere. Flags representing people that matter so much to you. And now, Lord, as we look into your word and we deal with the topic that sort of hits close to home for many in this room or those watching online, uh, Lord, I, I pray that, that you will be gracious and give us understanding. And may we leave here with a deeper and more robust faith in what we came in with. So thank you, Jesus, uh, for the power of your word, living and active. Speak to us today, we pray in your name. Amen. So if you looked at the message title in your notes, you saw that we're talking about uh, tough times. Anyone here experienced a little bit of that uh, in life? If anybody here has never been through a tough time and you really don't anticipate ever going through one, uh, you're welcome to go to the cafe right now and just enjoy one of my peaches and cream muffins uh, that are there. But if in, you're in the middle of something, a challenge right now, or you think that just maybe there might be a few more on the way, this message today is for you. And the question is this, how do we not only survive the challenges that we face, but how can we thrive within them? You know, I think a lot of times what we do is we're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm like on the injured reserve, and we sort of feel like we're on the injured reserve for God's purposes. And we go, well, I'm going through this, it can be whatever. You know, job hunt, a move, a divorce, I've lost someone I love, chronic illness, whatever. We're like, you know what, God's gonna have other people he can use, but right now, like, I'm sort of like, I am so stressed out, I don't think How can we maybe see that differently and say, God, maybe even on the injured reserve, you might do your best work through me in this situation more than I ever thought possible. I sent out an email to the church family the other day, and I said, you're gonna hear two testimonies. If, if you wanna sign up for the church email, and the green card is put, Jonathan's emails, and they go about once a week. We probably have 4,000 or 4,500 people who have signed up for those. And I mentioned in that one this week, I said, um, we're going to have a testimony from the first century, and we're gonna have a testimony from today. And, and both of those testimonies giving evidence to the fact that God can work not only in us in the tough times, but sometimes he accomplishes his best work through us. And if you could leave here today with a greater sense of, God, could you really do that through me? And trusting him that in whatever hard time you're going through right now or what you may go through, that you'll say, God, I'm willing to trust you. And I want to have eyes to see this challenge the way you do, that you're not wringing your hands going like, oh my goodness, like I turned away for a moment and John, look what he's going through. But no, you knew all about it. You never turned your face away and God, you know, and you have a plan for me in this moment. If we can leave here today with that kind of faith, having heard the testimony of the Apostle Paul and a testimony from today, I think we would see the family of God multiply, which is what the book of Acts is all about. So we're gonna look at our first testimony in Acts chapter 26. We've been looking through this historical account written by Dr. Luke, one of Paul's traveling companions, also the author of the biography of Jesus by that name. So Luke wrote, was one of the most prolific writers in the New Testament between the Gospel of Luke and this book of Acts. And here in the book of Acts, we get a behind the scenes sort of look at some of the challenges that Paul faced. And as we hear his testimony and his example, I think we begin to say, God, if you could do it for him, you can do it for me. So Book of Acts closes with Paul in prison, which is just the latest in a string of incredible hardships that he would endure. For starts, there's blatant unfair treatment. Paul is brought to trial on false charges that he had committed offenses against the Jewish law, against the temple, against emperors. They're false charges, but none, nonetheless, it, he had to go to court and, and, and you were almost presumed guilty until proven innocent. And it was from people who despised Paul. Really, they despised the, the gospel that Paul stood for. And as Paul is going around and he's telling people about Jesus and this movement of Jesus followers is just growing up and multiplying and, and this, this church that had grown, started with just 120 people is now like thousands and thousands, not just in the nation of Israel, but to the 
like all over the Mediterranean area and they're going like, we gotta put a stop to this. And they falsely accuse the apostle Paul. It's interesting, like Jesus, Paul was subjected to a series of trials. You'll see that in your notes or on the screen there. Each of them brought to trial five times. Did you know that? You'll see the list there. And throughout the cases, the authorities look at the evidence and they, or lack of evidence and they realize that neither one has done anything wrong. So like Jesus, Paul is declared not guilty, really, at least when authorities are talking like behind the scenes, behind closed doors, and they're like, let me just show you one example here. Acts 26, verse 30. Acts 26, verse 30. Paul has just given this, his defense before a, all these, uh, just a, a ton of people, big spectacle, government leaders. And after hearing the accusations against Paul and Paul's own testimony, here's what happens, verse 30. <clears throat> the king rose and with him the governor, that would be Festus, and Bernice and those sitting with them. And after they left the room, they began saying to one another, this man, Paul, is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. That was just one of three times that that was declared to be the case about Paul. Unjustly accused, unfair treatment, but that wasn't it for Paul. He also faces natural disasters. If you look at the next chapter, chapter 27, the heading in my Bible says Paul sails for Rome and about halfway through it says the storm and then the shipwreck. And Paul and his companions are among the 276 pa uh, passengers on a ship that is taking them uh, across the Adriatic for various purposes. For Paul's purposes, it was to stand trial in Rome. And if you want to get sort of a snapshot on this one, if you look at chapter 27, verse 14, here's what it says. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. What happens, verse 20, when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. These, they're, like, they're like, we're done. We're on the ship. If we, I mean, what do we do? If we get in a lifeboat, like we're just gonna be like turned over in no time. And so they're on this ship. You'll see a map on the screen of where they were heading. Long story short, after a few weeks, not, not hours, not just a couple of days, but after many days of terror on the seas, this ship hits a sandbar gets battered to pieces by the surf and God's grace, the passengers escape, every one of them. They're clinging to pieces of wood, they swim to shore. And if Paul was thinking perhaps, wow, like can things get any worse? What happens next would have at least put me over the edge. And that's chapter 28. So chapter 23 through 26, unjust, unfair accusations. Chapter 27, a shipwreck. Chapter 28, uh, the ship breaks up, they swim to shore, they're soaking wet, freezing cold, so Paul helps to build a fire. Chapter 28, verse four, here's what happens. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by the heat, you know, it just, it nails him, it fastens itself to his hand. So he's attacked by a poisonous snake. Paul's lucky day, right? He survives by God's grace, but it doesn't end there. A few verses down in Acts 28. Uh, we're going to look at verse 16. Paul has finally arrived in Rome, battle-weary, barely surviving, legal custody. And here's how the book of Acts ends, verse 16. It says this, when we got to Rome, this is Luke writing, Paul was allowed to live by himself with a soldier to guard him. So there you have it. You have unfair treatment. You have a natural disaster, that shipwreck. You have a He's bitten by a snake or whatever, and then he ends up in jail, which would be for two years under house arrest. Anybody read, read that book that we read as kids? It was a terrible, no good, horrible, very bad day. Remember that? I think Paul could say like, hey, that's, that's the title of my book, you know, or a chapter in my life. Tough times. We all go through them. But here's, here's what we're going to see, is that Paul, instead of being beaten down, discouraged and going like, oh my goodness, I'm just like this, I'm done. 
that God does something through Paul's life in the middle of all of this that you go, God, could you do it for me? So I told you we were going to have a, a testimony from the first century. That's Paul. We're going to come back to his own perspective on that. But also we're going to have a testimony from today. And I'd like to introduce to you a new member here at Grace who has actually became a member a couple months ago, but Sean and his mom have been coming to Grace for two years. And uh, he told me how he does some public speaking, and I, I, I'm really glad that Sean was willing to give his testimony today. And I'd like you to welcome uh, to the platform Sean Walker. Sean, great to have you here. So Sean and I uh, share a love for Cleveland sports and also for Jesus. Sean, thank you so much for being here and uh, telling us your story. And Sean's going to do it in a creative way, so I'll let him go from here. Hello, many of you do not know me, but my name is Sean Walker. I am a new member of Grace, although I have been attending church here for almost two years. I was diagnosed with cerebral palsy at eight months of age. Like Paul, when he was struck down from his horse and blinded, my family and I knew my diagnosis would come with many storms. Although we did not know exactly what they would be or when they would come, I have had the support of many people in my 30 years of life. In Paul's journey, as a newly convicted Christian, he had people like Ananias and Barnabas who stood by him, my mom and her prayer partner, as well as many others, have kept me in their daily prayers. When people first meet me, they often feel afraid to talk to me, or they talk to me as though I am a young child. Although I assure you, I have not killed anyone like Paul, Sometimes their approach feels like the one Ananias had and the apostles before Barnabas spoke up for him. That is, people already think they know what I have or do not have to offer before they ever get to know me even though most of the right side of my brain cells died shortly after I was born. Yes, you could say I am half-brained. <laughs> I feel very blessed by God that I have been given enough intelligence that I was able to graduate from college. In my interview on becoming a member, I shared that when I was in high school, I realized if Jesus was not God, my disability and my life would have no purpose. That was when I decided to turn my life over to Jesus. No matter what challenges I had to deal with, my biggest challenge with people who do not know me is my inability to be understood. I fought this all through high school until I was convinced almost forced to get a communication device. Through that, I was able to get a degree, get two jobs, deliver messages on biblical topics, and advocate for people with disabilities. There have been many situations in my life when I have been amazed how everything lines up perfectly. I know this is Christ. He promises that he will never leave us or forsake us. 
some of the other challenges for me are relying on strangers for total care. When I was away at college, there were times I was left in bed for 18 hours because the aide did not show for their shift. I had to leave college and come home for a medical emergency that changed my whole course of direction for finishing my degree. All of this has been a learning experience to help me know that God journeyed with me and had something better for me in the long run. Everyone in this church and beyond has challenges. No matter what your challenges are, lean on Jesus and they will be easier. They may not go away, but you can trust that they are in your life for a reason. And they are in his hands. Like my disability, which I expect will not go away, I know with Jesus at my side, God will give me the strength to get through it. Amen. Sean, thank you so much. What a powerful story. Appreciate that, brother. Like how Sean said at the close, he said, no matter what your challenges are, lean on Jesus and they will be easier. They may not go away, but you can trust that they are in your life for a reason and they are in his hands. Are we willing to believe that? That God, whatever you allow my life, you may not cause it. God doesn't cause evil. He doesn't cause divorces, he doesn't cause other, he doesn't cause violent act, but can, can we trust that God can use it and we can say it's not without reason? It's not meaningless. When Sean said back in high school, he said, I realized with my disability, if Jesus isn't alive, then my disability, my, my life, all of us could say that right is meaningless. It's without purpose. But when we say we have a God who sees, who knows, and can take every situation and he can say, if you'll trust me, not only will you survive this, but I will do things through your life that your impact will grow to levels you never thought possible. If God could do it for Sean, if he could do it for the Apostle Paul and for so many others, we say, okay, God, I believe you can do it for me. I, I believe you can do it for me. Sean, thank you so much. You know. Some of you might think, well, I wish we could hear what the Apostle Paul felt like. Luke writes the book of Acts, and he tells us what happened. It's the facts about, you know, unjust treatment and the snake and shipwreck, and he's in prison and all the rest. But what did Paul think about that? What if we could have his journal entry? You know we do, in a way. When Paul is in Acts 28, in that historical situation, he's under house arrest. He writes letters. And one of the letters that he wrote is to the Christian friends he had in the city of Philippi. And so you have the book of Philippians today, which was written when Paul was under house arrest. And Philippi sort of peels back the curtains and says, you want to know what Paul was feeling in the midst of that? He'll tell you right here. So let's keep a finger in Acts chapter 28, and let's turn over to Philippians chapter 1. And if you look at the back of your notes, I'd like us just to look for a few moments. How can God work through our tough times? Philippians chapter 1, just sort of dividing up that first chapter into three sections. First, Paul makes clear the tough times are a great prompter to pray. Verse 4, here's what he says, Philippians chapter 1, verse 4, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy. What does he pray? Verse 9, And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Here's Paul in the prime of his life. He could have written a letter and just said, dear friends, my life is horrible right now. 
I'm dealing with unjust accusations and can't wait to get out of here. The prison food is terrible. And if you guys, he doesn't do that, does he? In fact, some have said this is like, this is Paul's most joy-filled letter. And he goes, hey, y'all. Paul spoke Southern. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, and he goes, hey, y'all. He goes, you know, God is at work and Jesus is alive. And, and I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And, and I'm confident that God is at work in me and is at work in you. And Paul took this opportunity to pray. Some of you are in situations right now where you don't have the freedom for whatever reason to be able to go places or do things that you normally would do and you think I'm a little bit grounded. It takes all kinds of different shapes and forms, but some of you may be grounded and go, I, I, I feel like I'm stuck a little bit. Could it be that God is saying, I want you to take your prayer level to heights you've never had before. And you're gonna pray for people and have more impact through your prayers than you ever could have dreamed. The Apostle Paul was such an activist, you know, that as he went traveling around and he's going from city to city and all that, you know where Paul did most of his praying and most of his writing? From prison. And maybe his most significant impact would come from inside of a jail cell because his letters would endure for generations, for centuries. Friends, in your tough times today, I really believe that one of the things that God wants to do is he wants you to pray like you've never prayed before. When we're going through like everything is going awesome, it's not that we consciously go, I am not going to pray while things are going great. We just tend to just be like carried along by like success and things are going great and then we hit a bump in the road or we get in the ditch and we're like, oh Lord, and we, we, we call out to Jesus like we haven't in a long time, right? Tough times are a great prompter to pray. Second thing Paul talks about here is tough times give new opportunities to share Christ. The next section of his letter here in Philippians, the first chapter, in verse 12, here's what he says. He says, and I want you to know, my dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For anyone here, or everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I'm in chains because of Christ. So the palace guard are all going like, hey, have you talked to that guy, Paul? Hey, did you take care of him? That guy's like, he is totally like in Jesus. And who supposedly like died and came back to life and, and my sins are gonna be forgiven. And that guy's like completely convinced. I've never met a prisoner like him who's just got like this, like he seems like he's, he's not just doing everything he can to get out. So he tells the palace guard, he also, there's lots of curious people in town, in Rome. And if you go back to uh, Acts chapter 28, Verse 23, or if you, if you took your finger out of that section there, it's been a while since we were there. Uh, up on the screen, you'll see it says this. Chapter 28, verse 23, it says that people in the community arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets. He tried to persuade them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. So some are convinced, some aren't, but they all had a chance to hear the message about Jesus. And then here's how the book of Acts wraps up. Acts chapter 28, verse 31, the very last verse. What is Paul doing? He's in prison. And it says this, Paul proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Do you see what happens? There are all kinds of people who end up hearing about Jesus. Why? Because God used these circumstances in Paul's life to take him to places he never would have been to witness to people who never would have heard, who wind up in the family of God they never thought would be for them. Can the same thing happen for you and me? Absolutely. That in God's sovereignty, he lets us go through situations. Again, he doesn't cause them all. But you wind up in a court and you go, I never thought I'd have to get a lawyer before. And God's going, you know what? That lawyer needs Jesus just like everybody else needs Jesus. Or that bailiff in the court of that clerk that officer of the law, they, man, be a light there. You're going through, you get an audit from your taxes and you go, oh, oh, I hate this audit. And you go see an accountant and you start to talk to her and you realize that she's going through a rough time and you have an opportunity to reflect Christ to her. 
Or maybe you have a child who has some kind of issue with the teacher and you think, is God taking, and you're at a doctor's office and there's a receptionist there and that receptionist, little do you know, has been through tremendous loss. And I don't like doctor's offices, I like doctors, I just don't like to be there myself, right? Because it usually means something wrong with you. But you're waiting there and you think, God, is there somebody here you want me to, to touch, you know, to, with, with your kindness? You want me to re- represent you? And wherever you go, is it possible we could say, like Paul, all of this has happened to spread the good news. That it doesn't matter how difficult the situation, it doesn't, that even when it's not my intended agenda, but I go, God, okay, this seems like a really big detour to me, like a total waste of time. That God is saying, and you know what? And I have a purpose in this detour. Am I willing to trust him? You know, something else happens when we, uh, when we trust God like this. It's just a reminder um, in our faith that God is never surprised by our challenges. There's a verse in your note there from 1 Peter 4, don't be surprised at the fiery trials. God is never surprised. He, again, he, he never looks at your life and goes, okay, uh, plan C or D here. Not sure we're gonna figure this one out. Numbskull Jonathan got it. No, he just looks and he says, you know, um, this maybe wasn't my best plan, but uh, we're going to do something here and we're going to accomplish, you know, this doesn't surprise him. God is never surprised. You know the other thing? When we go through a difficult time and we let our light shine, we still reach out, we still have the sense of joy like Paul had and like Sean, you can tell, has, that, that there's something about that that's compelling for other Christians. And for Paul, it happens here. If you look back at Philippians chapter 1, Philippians 1 verse 14, here's what Paul says. He says, uh, because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message. Interestingly, he doesn't say, he's, he's fair, he doesn't say every single believer, he goes, most of them. When you represent Christ well, man, and you have faith in the midst of a challenge, you know, when Sean's up here and Sean's telling a story and you go, wow, I, w- I want faith like that. I want to be able to believe that God has a reason for everything we go through and that if I'm willing to trust him, that God is going to accomplish things that I didn't think possible. Mary and I got a letter recently from someone who uh, started coming to Grace and just read a portion of this. She says, I just wanted to tell you that I really enjoy coming to Grace. I started coming because my neighbor invited me. I take the message notes home so that I can look up the verses of Scripture. The Bible has been so foreign to me up until now. I never felt worthy of opening the Bible or speaking about Jesus. She talks about it. They never went to church. And then she says, now I'm reading my Bible more and more. I feel like it's not frightening as it once was. And I see that it's for everyone to look at. You don't have to understand or learn anything before opening. You don't have to have permission. It's all just waiting for you. And we read that, and this person just like on a journey of discovery of the Bible and about Jesus, and how did it happen? I started coming because my neighbor invited me. And I, I read something like that, and I go, okay, Lord, there's people out there just waiting for an invitation. And we're, we can be inspired by that, the boldness of others. And, and so when you reach out and you have strength to believe and to say, God, I believe you're gonna use even this situation, that he uses your example to inspire and motivate other believers. Reach out, take a risk. God is already at work. You never know how your example will embolden and inspire others. So, so first of all, Paul says, uh, Tough times are a prompter to pray. Secondly, tough times give new opportunities to talk about Jesus. And thirdly, uh, they help us to remember that heaven is our ultimate home. How did Paul deal with being incarcerated, virtually forgotten for two years? Like Acts 28, he ends up in prison for two years ago. That's like, that's an injustice. Like I didn't even get to court and be able to defend himself and go free and be, you know, whatever. Uh, He's there for two years and, you say, well, how did, how did Paul deal with that? Here's what he says in verse 21. Familiar verse, maybe you didn't know that it was written from within a prison cell. Here's what he says. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. 
Next verse, I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. That's how Paul says it. He's, he's going, man, whatever, however long I'm in prison, this isn't my ultimate home, right? I'm just as the old chorus one, I'm just a passing through. Yesterday I stood on this platform and I uh, spoke at uh, the funeral for a dearly loved friend here at Grace. Man, it was a tremendous encouragement to me and so many others here and his family as well. And I had been given his Bible by his family. He said, hey, if you want to look at it this week before you speak, and I'm, I'm looking through it, just amazing. It's like underlined like a third of his Bible and bracketed and highlighted and all kinds of things. And just, I thought, this is a guy who loved Jesus and loved, loved the word that Jesus has given us. And so I felt prompted to speak from a, uh, Philippians 3, and I, I go and look in his Bible, and sure enough, it's bracketed, underlined, and just at the end it said, how wonderful. And here's just opening part of that verse. It says this, but our citizenship is in where? Is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, our Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power as that has brought everything under his control will also transform these bodies to be like, and they're gonna be like his glorious body. Our citizenship is in heaven. You might have an American passport, Canadian, you might have British or whatever country maybe you grew up in and, and you're from. That is not our first citizenship. I am not, first of all, a U.S. citizen. This is just my temporary home. I am a citizen. The moment I put my trust in Christ, I'm a citizen of heaven, right? So you might be in a, a, a hardship right now that you go, it's not gonna change, Jonathan. I have cancer. I'm always gonna have that C word hanging over my head. Or I went through the divorce and they're married to someone else, like I, it's done. Or I lost someone I dearly love, like they die, like they're not gonna come back. And I'm gonna live like this and you go, it's not going to get better in the sense of, so what do I do? And Paul goes, you know what? Because this isn't your home. This is not your final home. Your citizenship is in heaven. You're home yet to come. And he says, man, I look forward to that. I don't know what kind of situation you're going through right now. The Lord knows. But when we hear the testimony of the Apostle Paul, testimony of so many through the centuries, testimony of Sean, and we say, God, I want to have that kind of faith in you to believe there's a reason for whatever I'm going through. You're not surprised. You're not incapable of overcoming, but God, you want to use me right in this situation to trust in you, and my impact can be far greater than I ever thought possible. What is he calling you to do? To trust him. Lord, I'm gonna trust you in the midst of this situation. I'm not gonna stay in the injured reserve or think we're done. I'm trusting in you. Lord, do whatever you want through my life. Let's tell him that in prayer. Would you pray with me, Lord Jesus? Thank you today for the example of so many. As Hebrews 11 talks about at 12, there's a cloud of witnesses who have gone on before us and are around us. And Lord, like them, we want to be those who, who say, Lord, here's my life. God, whatever you want to do. If I'm on, on, on the top and just saying, God, this is amazing, or if I'm in the valley, Lord, and saying, Lord, I, I, I don't know what you can really do here, but Lord, we're going to trust in you. So Lord, whatever little bit of faith we have to believe that, would you strengthen our faith and empower us by your Holy Spirit to believe that you're not surprised and you're fully able to do more than we could ever ask or imagine in our current circumstances. Lord, we feel our own weakness, but we see your strength. And so we say we're available. Do through us whatever you desire. For your name, for the sake of the people around us, we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. So Robin is going to sort of sing this song as a prayer for all of us. And uh, the team's going to lead us. The words will be on the screen. Our ushers will receive the offering during this song. And then there will be two songs at the close that we'll just have a chance to respond to, to pray at the front. But during this one, let Robin just sort of express our own hearts and say, God, that's what I want to be true in my life. Ushers, you're welcome to come. Thank you.
among the shadows, you wiped my tears away. I felt the pain of heartbreak, I've seen the brighter days. And I've prayed prayers to heaven from my lowest place. And I have held your blessings, God, you give and take away. No matter what I have, your grace is enough. No matter where I am, I'm standing in your love. On the mountains, I will bow my life to the one who set me there. In the valley, I will lift my eyes to the one who sees me there. When I'm standing on the mountain, I didn't get there on my own. When I'm walking My dreams get broken In you I hope again No matter what I know I'm safe inside your hands On the mountains I will bow my life To the one who set me there In the valley I will lift my eyes To the one who sees me there When I'm standing on the mountain I didn't get there on my own When I'm walking with us as we continue to worship today. Whatever you're going through, whatever is on your plate today, we open the altar, open the front for you to come. Lay your burdens down at his feet. He is here, ready and waiting.
Father, we thank you so much that you go before us each day. Lord, no matter where we're coming from or no matter where we're going, you are good and you are a constant presence in our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus. When peace like a river attendeth my way when sorrows like sea billows roll whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say it is well it is well 
Hey, just a reminder that we have a service at 6 p.m., same service, um, same testimonies, and feel free to invite someone to come back and join us tonight. So glad that you came today, that you have a God who sees you, who knows you by name, and loves you more than you will ever be able to comprehend. And his power, he'll take every single circumstance in your life and use it to accomplish good for those who love him. Sean, thank you again for being here today, all four services, really appreciate that. Um,